Hey everyone, it is Dr. Nicole Carter with Smart Brown Girl and Dr. Danisha Blake. And today we will be um, discussing Wayward Lies Beautiful Experiments by Sadia, Sadia Hartman. I hope everybody has, you have your book. I'm like trying to figure out what where the camera is. Um, and also your syllabus. Um, if you have not gotten your syllabus, make sure to go to uh, the Smart Round Girl website and pick up that syllabus um, so that you can follow along with us. We'll be going through book one today, but um, it's a lot of information in all of these books. So mm -hmm. <laughs> um, thanks for those who are signing on and watching with us. Uh, we also wanted to give or well, acknowledge the passing of uh, Bell Hooks um, today. Uh, I, I personally can say for myself, I'm saddened by that loss. She is the reason why I am the Black feminist I am today. Um, she is the reason why I do the work I do. Um, I would not be here reading any of this stuff if it weren't for her. Um, and so I also want to recognize like just how much of a powerhouse she is as well. So not just her death, but just the presence. Right. Yeah. I think uh, for me, the first book that I really read that got me into this, this area was Killing Rage. And, um, and I just, it changed my life. And I've, I, I think I I don't think I've read everything that Bell Hooks has put out because she has over what thirty books, um, but a, a lot of her stuff has just been really impactful, and um, she's just gone too soon. Yeah, um, she was only sixty nine. Only that's so young. And, yeah, so it's know. a great loss. So when you have time, pick up some Bell Hooks and yeah. read some things in her memory. <laughs> We read all about love last yes, year. Yes, all about um, love. Uh, one of my favorites is teaching to transgress. Mm -hmm. Also, talking back, talking feminist, talking black. Mm -hmm. Tons of tons of works. It's actually over forty. Over forty. Uh, oh, girl. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we're gonna get started. Yes. Yeah, with absolutely. our book one. Yep, and it starts on if you are if you do have a syllabus, we're gonna start on page twelve with the um, terrible beauty of the slum. And I'm not gonna read every summary um, in its in its entirety, but I'll just read the first sentence and then we'll hop into the first question. So, book one opens with a chapter that outlines the landscape of the dark ghetto, the slum that has been the exodus of Italian and Jewish immigrants, and now is inhabited primarily by Black people. So what does Hartman mean when she writes, for her, it's just a place where she stays and no one ever settles here, only stays, waits for better and passes through. At least that is the hope. So that's on page three and four of the book. Well, I can just say like for me, um, I think it's pointing out the fact that um, that place is not her whole self. Like she's more than uh, that space. She's uh, kind of forced to exist in. Um, and then also um, it's not representative of everything that she is either. And so there's more to, I, I feel like a lot of times, um, like people of color, um, get, and particularly Black folks, and I guess I will say Black folks, Latinx, Latino, Latina folks, like, get um, labeled by the area that they're, they're living in or forced to exist in. Um, and then I, I also think it was important her saying, um, at least that is the hope, because um, I don't know. I don't know if it's always like this hope that you're going to leave a space, but I, I do believe like there's a hope for prosperity and better. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what what is being um, discussed there, what is meant by that. Yeah, I agree. I think 
I, I, I like the hopefulness of knowing like this is just temporary. This is not my home and um but this is the place where I'm currently living and, and trying to create a life for myself in. And so um I I think that we, you know, when we talk about like wayward um girls and what is this, girls uh riot is black girls troublesome women and queer radicals like i think we often think about um them in ways that or we're taught to think about them in ways that were like you know they're never going to be amount to anything and um i think this gives us um uh, some kind of access into their um their thoughts and their interior lives to say they actually did want something um and it may not align with like societal standards or expectations um but it it meant that but it was something that they desired so i think that's what that quote meant for me yeah so hartman writes that each new deprivation raises doubts about when freedom is going to come if if the question pounding in her head, can I live, um, is one to which she could ever give a certain answer or only repeat in anticipation of something better than this, bearing the pain of it and hope and the hope of it, the beauty and the promise. What does this highlight about Black people's mindsets as they migrated from Southern to Northern cities in the 20th century? Um. I don't know. I'm just thinking about like, uh, so, you know, like the migration, thinking of space, I guess, like differences in like ability to move about and freedom, uh, bodily freedom to like go and move where you please. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I just keep reading the part girl where you headed and it's like mm -hmm. i don't know i remember like you know aunts and grandparents like where you think you're going mm -hmm. like and it's like dang can i live that's what i like imagine her saying yes. <laughs> can yes. i just like i mean we just got free i can't move as i please mm -hmm. um but i also just think of like this migration and this assumption that uh, freedom will actually exist in these spaces, but you are like confined in a different way. So, yeah, I think about like the this reminds me of just like those those bumps in the road, like those hiccups where you're just like another thing and on my journey toward you know my own freedom dream or whatever, and so. Um, but, you know, and, and really thinking about like how, you know, only or only repeat in anticipation of something better than this. And so like having to constantly remind oneself, like, I got this, you know, mm -hmm. so that's what I think about as um, I think that that hope for the better life, but also that reality that their struggles um, really, I think, provides a certain understanding about the, the migration, the great migration. And this one is talking more, this book in particular, her research covers, I think, Philadelphia and New York. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ready? Um, I can read the next one. Okay. Uh, so the next question asks, what do you learn about the lives of black girls and young women? by focusing on the interior lives, their homes, and the way they interact with physical spaces of the slums? Mm -hmm. I um, I mean, especially this particular set of Black girls, but I think, I think we, you know, may have in recent years seen a lot more of interiority when we talk about pleasure and we have a lot of different scholars kind of talking about um, black women's um, embodiment, sexuality, and existence in a different way. But um, I think that so much of what we have, we still, it's still kind of um, embedded in the culture of dissemblance and, you know, this sort of um, not airing dirty linen and things like that. 
And so getting a chance to look at like the physical space and to be able to get insight into, you know, where these women lived and created home and had all of these different um, interactions. And sometimes what people might see is deviant, right? Or, or salacious. And, um, but we get a chance to understand that those were the things that made them human. And I, I think a lot of what the, you know, what we've learned when black women are trying in those, in that time period, trying to create, um, you know, political space for themselves. It was a lot about how do we appear open, but also closed in a way that we're not, we're, we're, we're kind of vulnerable, but not really. Whereas this, I think is trying to get us to see um, something different in terms of vulnerability amongst um, these black women and girls and young girls. Yeah. I think that's um, actually pointed out. So there's a, on page five and six, um, mm -hmm. specifically talking about photographers, researchers, things like that, and how they come into these spaces and they don't n really get it. And so mm -hmm. uh, it reads, they fail to discern the beauty and they see only the disorder missing all the ways black folks create life and make bare need into an arena of elaboration. Mm. Um, it goes on talking about like the dress of women, the things they're wearing. Um, and like you said, and so when I think of intimate, which was part of this, this question, like intimate lives, um, I mean, interior lives, I'm thinking of, so not just like what's happening in their home, mm -hmm. what's happening amongst them, but what's also like happening within them. Yeah. And yeah. how it's much more complex. Like I think people like to uh, create these uh, visions of, or like uh, depictions of black women as like always struggling. Mm -hmm. And it's like, so where you see struggle, they see joy. Yeah. Like, and so yeah. Uh, it's just, there, there is a complexity that is not being tapped by when you just take a picture of someone, particularly. Yeah. And it, questions relate to this later, but particularly when you are not of that area. So right. exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, so um, we then go into mm -hmm. the next chapter, which is a minor figure. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> hmm? oh, I'm just, I burped. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and so uh, it explores images related to Black life, uh, particularly mm -hmm. younger Black women and Black girls. Um, and uh, Hartman has a lot of images, which I actually appreciate uh, mm -hmm. throughout the book um, because it like humanizes what we're seeing. It's yeah. very interesting to me, but yeah. yeah. So I found um, myself trying to like find the images she was referring to, and she doesn't always do it in like the order that some of the pictures that she references are talked about throughout, but they don't always come in the same order or they might be things that she pops back to. And so just thinking about like, you know, sometimes she really focuses in, which I think is a minor figure um, on a, a particular image, right? Is that the one where the girl is mm -hmm. naked girl? Yeah, because yeah. it's in the backdrop. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll shut up and we can answer that. <laughs> because I lost my thought. <laughs> so the first question is, uh, what does Hartman mean when she writes the fiction of a proper name would evade the dilemma, not resolve it? How does this line connect to our reading of Horton Spiller's Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, which we read um, previously mm -hmm. this year or earlier this year and her arguments about way Miss. Uh, the way misnaming was a tool in maintaining Black women's subjugation. Um, you want me to read the whole thing or? 
Um, I can because it will <laughs> provide context. So it's a thick question. So huh? That's a thick question. It a is. Full, it's a full body question. It is. <laughs> so <laughs> it says consider the following passage from Spillers. Um, the nickname by which African American women have been called or regarded or imagined on the new in the new world on the new world scene. The opening lines of this essay provide examples, demonstrate the powers of distortion that the dominant community seizes as its unlawful prerogative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and if you have mama's baby, papa's maybe around somewhere, it's on page 69. Mm -hmm. But both um, basically refer to this concept of naming and who is allowed to do the naming. Mm -hmm. um, and so I can repeat the question. The question was, um, what does Hartman mean when she writes, the fiction of a proper name would evade the dilemma and not resolve it? Yeah, I think that what she's talking about is that the the names given to us or assigned to us don't actually give us any clarity on who this person really is. Um, it's not the full extent of her who, her being. And I, I think when I wrote this, I was, yeah, thinking about all of the ways that Black women um, have been named and the way that that creates this sort of identity category crisis um that isn't that that isn't necessarily resolved um and potentially not even resolved by us naming right as other black women or black folks naming them um and so that's what i got from that yeah uh, and I keep uh, thinking about the beginning of that quote, the fiction of a proper name. Uh -huh. So who provides that proper name? Mm -hmm. Who determines how, like, why that name is proper, right? Like mm -hmm. having, so at all times it's someone else naming these women. And that might be like naming in the ways that we, you know, like, uh, my how my name is Nicole, or naming um, and st by using stereotypical images to refer to people, mm -hmm. um, and the uh, the things associated now with Black womanhood, often like stereotypes and things like that. And so, regardless, it's a fiction mm -hmm. because it was made up by someone other than that woman, so mm -hmm. or that girl. Yeah. And I think the idea of dilemma, like, isn't about, I think it's about complexity, not necessarily it, you know, creating it being about like, um, pinning somebody down or as Brittany Cooper says, mastering um, this black girl or black woman. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I think it, it, inspires us to dig deeper and to to say like there's more than um than what a name any kind of name but particularly proper name could give us yeah and i don't know i so for me i've always thought of naming as important right like being able to um you know like identify oneself for yourself and like being able to you know especially in a in an era where like people like to uh and am i i don't usually have this happen to me because i have a simple name but um but you know like i don't <laughs> name, right and so when people uh name say someone's name and they um mispronounced or misspelled mm -hmm. um, and then they're corrected and it's like, oh, you know what I meant. Right. You know what I'm saying? And so okay. there is a power mm -hmm. in naming. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a power in renaming. Yeah. 
And so it's complex because it is like this constructed thing that has been like handed down by others mm -hmm. and ultimately those in power yeah. over us. So, right. but at the same time, there's an ownership and being able to say, and some like type of freedom and being able to say like, this is who I am. Right. And I'm saying this is who I am for me. Yeah. So, um, and then we have a mm -hmm. comment. Mm -hmm. Yes, me too. I immediately thought of the things we do to instill respectability, including the naming of our children and ourselves. Something so personal that made someone else's. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, even just like, I remember somebody telling me, like, asking me when, I, after I got my, P or like, when I get my PhD, am I going to like change my name to, or like shorten it? so that people won't recognize it as an ethnic name. And I was just like, mm, I mean, but as soon as you look at my CV, you go, no. <laughs> so, like, I don't know, I, I no, absolutely not. Like, you know, and also this way that we try, like, you know, I, I'm all for, you know, nicknames and things like that, but imposing nicknames on people when their name is too hard to pronounce, I think is, is, violence and so you know my friend i always like when i go to starbucks i always just give them my last name and my friend is like why do you do that like you need to make them spell your name out like stop trying to make it easy on them by giving them the simplified version um but usually it's just like but i don't want to see my name spell wrong <laughs> so i'm just not because even when you spell it they still get it wrong you like mm -hmm. okay. you just don't hear what you well they're getting the call wrong even though it's not difficult Child. Yeah, I'm like, you're here making up stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so. like, I don't know where y'all got that from, but that ain't it. So, <laughs> but yeah. Um, so the next question, uh, again, talking about namelessness. So mm -hmm. I'm going a step further. But Hartman points out that some girls and women chose namelessness and refused to be in the archive, either in part of, in part or altogether. What do you think about black girls and women who do not want to be found in the archive? Should we be working to find them? What kind of ethics or prim principles do you think one should adopt when working to honor and tell the stories of black girls and women who may have intentionally chosen to not be seen by people documenting them and their lives. Mm -hmm. You and these questions. So by the way, everyone, Dr. <laughs> uh, wrote this syllabus. Yeah. I wrote this. Some heavy questions, okay? I was writing this like I was teaching a graduate. Yeah, class. that's what, I like it. <laughs> I can use it in a, a qualitative research class. Because I was just like, and then when I read back, I was like, ooh, intense. But I love this book and I love doing deep dives. And so, um, yeah, when I when I was thinking about that question, uh, that I think I, I think about this and approach it because this is I was teaching. I mean, if I were still teaching, I think you could definitely use this in a research <laughs> course because I think that it asks a lot of ethical questions around like archives and um, a lot of people who are historians. You know, I've had a one of my um, faculty members said, you know, I study history because all the people are dead. And it provides, I think, a assumption of, of agency to really, um, you know, be able to kind of use. And I think you should be careful and have some ethics. But I think there's still this sort of sense that, like, when you study people who are alive, there's so many variables and i think also you know do what what is what does consent look like when when they're alive but i think this question made me think about like even if they weren't they had agency at some point and they used that to remove themselves from the archive and what do we do when we're trying to recover um their stories and their lives um and, and trying to do just justice to them. Um, but in the moment in which they were, you know, um, 
being documented or trying or when, when someone was trying to document them, they had chosen that. And so should we honor those things um, or should we leave them alone? And I don't know. I don't know how where I really stand on that question, because um, I think we have to always think about like what is the political work that we need and, and want to do? And also, do we do that work um, when we've seen that names are not there or, or, or something like that? Do we still choose to do it um, with a greater, I guess, a greater uh, desire to tell a, a, a narrative around girls who are forgotten? Yeah. This so... Um... I've been thinking about this question because like I am someone who doesn't know and uh, I mean, essentially a lot of us don't know like a whole history, like a whole, you know, like side of our family. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like from my mother on, I don't know anything about them. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just keep thinking of like, the, the difficult nature of things that then exist for people who come after them. Mm -hmm. um, and like not having any, basically it was like they were invisible. Like, right. like they never existed almost. Like it's just a photograph. And, mm -hmm. and basically like for me, that's uh, similar to my mother's side of the family. Like mm -hmm. after one name and one photo, you can't find anything else. Yeah. Um, I also, you know, my grandmother changed her name. Mm. I don't know why. I want to know the story. Yeah. You know, like I want to. I want to figure it out. I yes, want to know. Do. That's a mysterious thing. Like why? You yeah. know, who were you before that point? Mm -hmm. You know, and so I think that. Uh, and then another thing is because I'm always thinking of health things, that's yeah. another component. It's like we have family histories that we never know. And there are people who are experiencing things today um, that perhaps their grandmothers, great grandmothers, great, 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 great grandmothers experience, but we would never know because right. those stories weren't passed down. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is complex for me because I do want to honor, you know, like mm -hmm. the view of and the choices that were made by these girls and women. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, I think of like the generations that come after them. Yeah. Yeah. I'm compelled by that too when you think about just so much of the different mental health things um you know predisposition predispositions to you know certain types of illnesses or cancers like those things are i think really important to know i mean i was i said i i think i know a good deal about my immediate family but sometimes i'm filling out medical forms and they're like you know, have you anyone in your family experienced all these different things? And you're like, mm. so I think in that regard, I'm definitely compelled to think about like, you know, that being unnecessary, being necessary. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, also, like the question asked about ethics or principles. Mm -hmm. related to um, working to honor and tell the stories of Black girls and women. And I know one of the things, like, in my, uh, when I was working on my research for my dissertation was, like, involved, uh-oh, uh, it was about involving them in the work itself. Tanisha, you still there? Yeah, I'm here. I just had to grab a blanket. I'm cold. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, but it was um, about involving them in the research itself. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then going back and when there was an analysis of something or like a discussion of the findings and things like that, um, making sure that they like saw it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, they also, several of the women who were part of my uh, research came to my defense. Mm 
mm. you know. Mm -hmm. So it was a relationship that was built as well. And that goes yeah. against like concepts of objectivity, which are like exactly. don't exist, by the way, but yeah. So <laughs> okay. and we have a question about that later on too, I think. Yeah. About ob objectivity. But yeah, I, I definitely think part like um having participants be a part of the research is I think a black feminist ethic. I mean, I think about who was it, Ruth Nicole Brown and like reading her work on black girls and this, you know, um different ethnography, Savannah Shange, I believe, had, you know, some of her participants, you know, really look in, look at the work. Um and also how do you make choices when they decide like I don't want to be that I don't want to have that part of my life in this narrative. And, you know, how can we allow for that to be telling still and, and also still honor that? So, yeah. Yeah, it's a difficult, I mean, but if you're in conversation, I think the, the idea is just to always be in conversation um, with those who are part of this. So, mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, we got. Oh, so this one is about naming, I think. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think naming is always required in cataloging our stories. That's true. Yeah. That is true. Um, anonymity offers protection and safety. Look, I can't see. And safety that we can't <laughs> offer in past since the naming hmm. part is sometimes a selfish action. Hmm. I, I agree. I mean, I. Yesterday I went to a um a homeless shelter in our in where I, near where I work and um the person who was kind of giving us a tour like even as he was like balancing like he didn't take us through where the um guests were like during like during the day so we could like gawk at them and like he honored that but he was still telling us stories about the residents and different like ex to be like an example and I was just like but do you have to tell us who they are? And I know that I probably couldn't find them or identify them because he didn't give their full name. But it was just like, do they, I wanted to ask him, like, do they consent to having their stories told in this way? Like, you know, because I, I think if part of the thing is about honoring their humanity, it's also about recognizing, like, I get it. That is an act of humanizing people who are, are, are seen as invaluable or not invaluable, unvaluable is it unvaluable even a word <laughs> not valuable in our society and undervalued, undervalued yeah. in our society and then yet you know i think that i wondered about the the agency of, of the people and if they had a choice um, yeah to be named so yeah so those are some good points yeah I'm also wondering if this is the Dominique McFall that uh, used to be a student here with me. Okay, just wondering. Um, <laughs> Let us know. Maybe she'll write it. Maybe she'll write it in there. Um, but yeah, so that is that's a great point. Um, who gets to like decide? what is shared mm -hmm. um, in terms of identity. Oh, it sure is. Okay. <laughs> hey, Dom. All right. So, <laughs> yeah. So who gets to decide that? Um, I mean, I think in like, well, obviously academic research, there are always, um, there are always these protocols in place to attempt to protect um, or really, yeah, uh, safeguard protected classes of folks. Um, but then other people get to decide what a protected class is. So there's that. Yeah. And we have, we bring all our biases into it, mm -hmm. right? And what constitutes as valuable research and, you know, what can be gleaned from a particular community, uh, you know, yeah. that also plays a part of, you know, of in into it. I cannot speak tonight. Um so we can move on, right? Mm -hmm. so according to Hartman, how did young black girls and women escape imposed visibility? What are some ways that black girls and women do this today? 
I can't remember where I got that question from, but as it related to the book, I think one example was the name, the choosing not to be named. Oh, I think she gives examples of like the different images of where they were averting from the camera. And so they recognized that they were being captured and they might like, I don't know, um, turn another way or um, so that you can't see their face or you see half of, of their their body or something like that. Um, so I think that's a couple of examples in the image and also within the naming. Um, Here's one, hold on. So it was the first, it was a page next to the beginning of this chapter. I don't know mm -hmm. So looking down, it yes. also talked about the person in the photograph uh, not being able to be found after the photo. This is mm -hmm. another one, looking mm -hmm. to the side. Yeah. Face to the side, it's like bad, but yeah. So having some type of autonomy, like even though a large part of their autonomy was taken away by the mm -hmm. photo being imposed upon them, but I'm still being able to like divert in yeah. some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, challenges that narrative of like wholly powerless or wholly powerful, and it starts to um, it it starts to challenge us to ask that question about what does power look like and who has it at one point, and so, yeah. Do we get another? Yep. Yeah. Um, I think I could think of so many, but the first thing I think of is virtual sex work where people choose to admit their identity. I also think of code switching in workplaces, schools as a form of protection. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, not just also like boundaries, mm -hmm. like not cho choosing not to disclose parts of personal parts of yourself. Mm -hmm. in the workplace and other spaces as well and organizations, things like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's done all the time. Whole so. ass families. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah. Because you know, I, I don't need you to know. Thanks. Mm -hmm. so, like, it's my business. <laughs> yeah. You know, not not inviting your, uh, not uh, friending your, your coworkers on Facebook. <laughs> oh, and it's a whole meme on Instagram about that. Or like, <laughs> actually it's a real, I think. And it's people are like, uh, when when my coworker says, I, I tried to find you on Facebook, but I couldn't find you. That's because I blocked you before you. Right. <laughs> like, it's a leave out of Cause now I gotta sit and have a little thing pending <laughs> in my damn inbox. I got a whole bunch of pending. Girl. Me pending too. Um, requests. Like, who are you? And no, not at all. Get stressed out, and I will just delete it. But then I, like, and then they ask me like, "Oh, I could." I'm like, I don't know what happened. Particularly people in HR and stuff like that. Oh, no, no, no ma'am, not at all. If you if you are above me anyway, you probably will never. But also in general, I'm just like, no. Follow me on LinkedIn. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what work folks be. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You want to read the next one? Or? Yeah, I can read it. So for those reading the a physical copy of the book, the text on page 26 and 27 um, is laid over an enlarged image of the African-American girl nude reclining on couch, the central image discussed in this chapter. So what do you think Hartman is trying to say visually for the reader? What do you think the girl is referred, why do you think the girl is referred to as nude rather than naked? Well, I can't remember, but I, I learned so much about the difference between nudity and naked as like nudity is like an artistic mm -hmm. like terminology to assume like a type of, almost like a type of dress. And naked is just like devoid of any agency or just anything um it is like raw material like the raw being of, of being unclothed yeah 
I, um, I often think of nude as like referring to like modeling. Yeah. Modeling when people are painting an image, mm -hmm. like this cultural artifact. Yeah. But then yeah. nakedness is sometimes, a lot of times, violence, like this mm -hmm. violent act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. And then I, so I say that she's extended in the, the first image. So mm -hmm. not when you flip over to 28, but on the, and that she's extended beyond the frame. Mm -hmm. So for me, um, it's demonstrating like this ambiguity It's demonstrating um, that her existence moves beyond the pages of this book. Mm -hmm. um, but then also the other smaller image, right? Like, yeah, this is difficult to do. I don't know, Lord. Um, but <laughs> uh, you know, it's like, um, and I think at some some point you talk to, talk about uh, adultification mm -hmm. and part of the question, and it's like um, innocence is taken away. Mm -hmm. It's like part of me like sees her as a little kid, just. A, yeah. You know, like sometimes yeah. little kids just like don't want to keep their clothes on. They just, right. they just go to bed, watch it. I mean, or on the sofa <laughs> watching TV. But then the other part is like, who did this? Yeah, because it's a photograph. So who made you do this? Yeah. So yeah. That, that the fact that it's like this image imposed upon her, right? Taken of her and from her. Yeah. Uh, then like reduces the child like she's not allowed to be a, a child. Uh, right. And so and there's multiple ever, ways you can look at it. Yeah. And did she ever have in innocence to, to be taken within this context of this artist, you know, deciding that I'm going to paint and I, and you know, the, the, the name nude implies that they thought that this was some artistic genius or some type of work of art and trying to show, I, I think that in some way I'm conflicted about it because it means that um, it it evades the violence of nakedness, you know? And so calling it a nude means that like, I don't know, did she, I mean, she did, I don't feel, I think the point is that we don't know where her agency is in this. Yeah, I feel like, so I do feel like Hartman is attempting to provide her with autonomy again, this child, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. uh, give her back the power yeah. that was taken. But right. then I also think of like, did it say when this was taken? Like the year? Yeah, I don't think uh, it I think I'd have to look into the glossary in the back for the but, images. Let's see. It doesn't say, I think. Oh, I think it's uh, 1882. So in thinking about 1882, this is a young black girl mm -hmm. who... Um, not that long before that would have been deemed property, yeah, uh, lesser than animal, right? Yeah. Uh, and I don't think uh, a couple of years or a few years um, would change that perspective. Mm -hmm. So it's like if people still believe they own black folks, yeah, then this yeah. is not a little girl. Yeah, this, this is, is something that I own, and I could take a picture of it if I want to. Yeah, because if you think about it, like the years from emancipation to that point when that was taken, mm -hmm. we still yeah. struggle with people with autonomy now, and people believing that black folks are actually like they belong to themselves. So yeah. like that that yeah. moment. At that moment, that was, you know, mm -hmm. I, I just I just think of like personhood not existing at that moment. So right. I like it. Um, it says looking at the photograph, one wonders if she has had ever been a child. 
So yeah. by, the age, by age 10, and this is on 29, by age 10, that she learned everything about sex she would ever need to know. By 12, had no interest in it. Did she know the women working in the street, the ladies in sporting houses, the sweet men, the badgers and thieves who lived in who lived on her block? Has she become prematurely knowing because of what had already been done to her by observing the world around her? Yeah. So she And then she, I just think like have black children, period, ever been allowed to be children. Yeah. And no. Dominique asked like will she stay she loves did she ever have innocence mm -hmm. and have black children ever been deemed mm -hmm. innocent at what point if they are deemed innocent is that you know negated yeah because yeah. we look at little children being treated like grown as adults, sorry of course grown adults <laughs> mm -hmm. today you know and even yeah. beyond that like yeah like animals so yeah yeah all right we don't we have um an intimate history of slavery and it begins with maddie a young woman who joins her mother in new york after leaving north is it no i i, I used to know how to say this hmm no, no folk. It's not Norfolk. 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 It's not pronounced that way by Virginians, but oh, Virginians. I, don't, I don't know. Norfolk. No. That's how we say it in Detroit. Norfolk. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think it's like Norfolk. <laughs> like it's, I don't know, but my friend will correct me. Um, so how? What does Hartman mean when she says that these intimate acts by the way were exceed transgression and negation. Consider the meanings uh, when she writes, to esteem her act, to regard rather than vilify Maddie's restive longing is to embrace the anarchy, the complete program of disorder, the abiding desire to change the world, the tumult, the upheaval, open rebellion attributed to wayward girl. Wayward girl. It is to attend to other forms of social life which cannot be reduced to transgression or nothing at all and which emerge in the world marked by negation, but exceed it. And that's on page 62. Um, <clears throat> and so the, the beginning question though is, uh, when she says these intimate acts, by the way, were exceed transgression and negation. I think that um, the whole point of this is that Often we see the behaviors, the lifestyles, whatever, of girls that and women that we've marked uh, wayward as a form of like deviance or a, a, a diversion from what is considered uh, pure, moral, ethical, um, and um, or it, 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 they're not worthy of even getting um, any kind of analysis or definition, and so. I think that she's trying to say that the work, these interior lives acts that they are um, engaging in are are more than just uh, deviance, purely deviance, or um, you know something not even worthy of of, of being um, in the master narrative. Yeah, um, we have a comment related to this. Um, yeah. It. Um. And it says, love this moment in the book that I felt was speaking to the defiance and the hope, the power, the freedom that Black women participate in, inspire, and orchestrate. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it is important. And I so I just keep thinking of, um, oh, now I can't think of the name. But it was a Bell Hooks book. Mm -hmm. Not teaching to transgress, but it is uh, insurging. Oh, yeah. I, I tell what you're talking about. I yeah. Talking. But it's just like about this the ability to like move beyond the confines provided or dictated by other people. Like you say, I'm wayward and I say, I'm free. Mm -hmm. You know? So, and it is, I mean, to me, it is a transgression, but it is not like in the way that has been like deemed as this negative thing. Mm -hmm. So it's it's moving beyond the confines provided or 
forced upon black yeah. women and black girls. Are you looking the book up? <laughs> I was trying to, but because uh, I was trying to look up Insurgent, but I can't seem to find it. Yearning, homegrown. Yeah, no, I can't find it. I, I feel like I know what you're talking about, though. This is what Cornell was, too. Uh, breaking Bread oh. Insurgent. And Surgeon Black Intellectual Life. Uh, okay. Yeah. But um it's it's basically like it it is it's it's like um like their very existence is a radical act, and so uh it wouldn't be like again dictated by the views of other people. So like wayward is a is a is a term provided um by someone else. Mm -hmm. about them but we see like from the beginning of this book that they have whole lives yeah um whole experiences so uh, and hold on. daniela put on um, page 63 I'm trying to find it but i word. maddie wanted so much from the world and haven't allowed so little Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Now I got to go back to my questions. <laughs> so on page 47, the chorus, which is the, um, I can't remember how I defined it in the book. But the chorus is kind of like the backdrop, the in, in, in that kind of moves the story along, and, and also gives it that um, rhythmic kind of register. Um, and I just lost the page that I was on. No, oh, okay. So it says the kitchen was the field and the brothel. What is Hartman saying about the afterlife of slavery for girls and black women involved in domestic servitude? What a metaphor. I know. Um, and that was on page 47. So it was both the field and the brothel. They were made to do like this work continuously, but yeah. also take taken mm -hmm. advantage of. And I remember reading um, some things about domestic servitude and like this, like um, the voyeurism of white men mm -hmm. in those spaces and how black girls and women were like kind of picked. Mm. And really, if we want to be honest, black, black boys too, were picked to, you know, like chosen, if you will. Yeah. Um, and so that's like the brothel, yeah. the idea of the brothel. Um, but domestic servitude, I, I think it's a, a continuation of, um, it's like a combination of field work and uh, domestic work that existed then. But mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm. Um, and Daniela said, the chorus are the unnamed young women of the city trying to find a way to live and in search of beauty. Yes. Yeah. I love that when you, you get that sort of collective voice, but there's, I think some, I mean, but they're all, you know, singing at different registers and tunes. And, and so it just, you know, we see, you know, um, this community of unnamed people, but they, they construct this, this larger story. Yeah. And I still feel like that chorus still exists. Mm -hmm. Even if you think about, I, I I don't know why, but I thought of like missing girls, mm -hmm. particularly yeah. right now. And we think of um, native and black girls who are not given the attention, but they, I I, I have to believe in my heart of hearts that they still exist yeah. here, somewhere. Yeah. And it's this chorus of girls like trying to Find a way mm -hmm. to live. Yep. 
you know, um, and I don't know why I thought of that, but yeah, but it's a, you know, like it's very, uh, particularly uh, again, young women of color, just not, you know, it's like speaking to the voices that still exist, even when people try to silence yeah. voices. Mm -hmm. um, and then just the, the speech, like attempting to exist, to demonstrate like they are alive, they are here. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they are beautiful and whatever. And what making the active <laughs> choice to see them and hear them when there are so many structures in place that are about silencing. Um, and so I think that, yeah, that is, that, that's the work that this does. Yeah, we are at seven fifty eight. Um, <laughs> what you want to do? We got a question, or do we have we one more question? Oh, we Dominique it. said something as well. So she said, "So let me say it like this." Yes. So <laughs> that was the one. It actually reminded me of those of us today who straddle predominantly white spaces professionally having to put up with the same stuff we would have we uh would have in non white spaces. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So yeah. That <laughs> So for those who don't know, <laughs> Denisha and myself <laughs> work in those predominantly white spaces. But that's all we're going to say. Yes. Child. Actually, that's not all I'm going to say. I'm not going to speak for her. But I'll just speak for me. Like, I get yes. 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 Um, and at some point, you get tired of, like, being the chorus mm -hmm. and nobody listening. What they call it, the profit in your own land. Mm -hmm. you yeah, you get tied. Tied. Yeah. Just talking to preaching to the choir. Yes. Literally. And and yes, Dominique, uh oftentimes ostracized in both communities as a result of it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We gotta be very <laughs> careful, you know, because we, you know, it's a tried and true, you know, all skin folk and kin folk. And mm -hmm. you know, that applies here. But it's rough because you're like, damn, I can't. It's like the bridge poem by Kate Russian. It's like, I gotta be. Oh, I love it. Come uh, on. I, I love that poem. Black people, oh my God. White people, I gotta explain the, the gay people to the Like, it's just too much. It's too much. Come and on. That is, one, that is one of my favorite I love that poems. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. Shout out to the bri a bridge called My Back because yeah that whole book yeah they they re i mean it was a couple of years ago that they re-released it but for a while you could only get like old copies of yeah, those which is fine mm -hmm. i'll look <laughs> give me somebody's uh written copy marked up copy i will take it but yeah i feel you though yeah um adultification is the process in which adolescents and teenagers are treated as adults this process allows for the justification of criminalizing and sexualizing black children. Why is it important to highlight that many of the characters in this book are girls and young women and people? Why do you think Hartman wanted to focus on black girls and young men, women and people for this project? Because just as we were stating, they are overlooked and ignored and adultification uh, works to continue that pattern. Um, that I do, I wholeheartedly believe that adultification is deeply connected to slavery mm -hmm. and the inability for young, um, particularly black children to be seen as that mm -hmm. children. Yeah. Um, and often we don't treat them as children either. Like we treat them as little, just short, <laughs> short, short people we own, basically. Yeah. And it's I think that that was even in Spillers when she was talking about like just the process of like making 
I think slave enslaved folks, adults, is how you are able to like sell them at a, a higher rate or whatever. If this person is um, in that in between space of being a breeder, if you will, but then you know, and you can you can say, well, they're fresh, right? They're fresh to be bred. Um, then that can justify you selling them off in that way. So I think that happens a lot. And, and it I, goes back to what uh, Dominique actually stated, like mm -hmm. having to, like being, so not just ostracized um, by multiple parties, but also like objectified by yes. multiple parties as well. Like even when a young girl gets her period, right? She's no longer seen as, but she's 12. Right. But you now, she's fast, mm -hmm. right? Cause she's on her period and can get pregnant. Right. She's right for, you know, who was talking about that? I mean, there's so many things, but I remember something in one of the books we read and I wish I could remember. Oh, I think it was in Thick where she was talking about like being ready or, or something like one of the, her uncles or somebody says something about her being ready. And it's just like, mm. but you know, yeah, I mean, even I try to stay away from like, we call my nephew like little man and, and, you know, and I'm just like, or we say young man and young woman. And I'm like, they're not, they're what? girls. If they were older than 18, but like, these are teenagers, these yes. are preteens, adolescents. Or when little babies are like, look at my little man getting yes. so big. Right. Yes. Little mama. And I just, I'm like, mm, can we not? Can I just be I a child? I know these are cute names, but they, I think if we really are, it takes seriously the way that adultification happens, we need to be mindful of just the innocuous language that we're using or think it we're using when we're just, you know, trying to talk about kids. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yes, y'all. This was great. Thank you, Dominique and uh, Daniela. I think I'm saying your name correctly. If I let me look at, let me see if I uh, missed it, Daniela. Hopefully, I'm saying your name correctly. But thank you for your comments tonight. Thank you for those who uh, participated and watched us. And we will be back. We're going to cover the rest of book one, and maybe we'll just go into book two mm -hmm. next time. Next um, Wednesday at seven. Yes. Yes. So yeah. tune in. You have some more time to read. Uh, and this book is on audio, Audible. Um, it's a really great listen. Um, just to capture the story, I think that what's really great is that this is kind of written in prose. And that's different for, um, I think, a, a historical, cultural historical book. Um, so, yeah. Or academic text, I might say. Yeah, um, I like it a lot. <laughs> That's funny. I like it a lot. Um, but yeah, thank you. Shout out to Daniela and Dominique for keeping our chat going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. making comments. Yes. yes. See you all. Mm -hmm. Please show up next Wednesday. Thank you. See y'all later. Bye.